Hi guys, welcome to the second in my series of Guild Wars 2 guides and gameplay videos. Today we're going to be taking a closer look at crafting in Guild Wars 2. I'm going to call this an intermediate guide because we're going to go into slightly more detail than my first guide. We're going to talk a little bit more about gathering and how to store all the goodies you accumulate. We'll also talk briefly about leveling more than two crafting disciplines on one character. And then the rest of the video will be focused on making the best use of the materials you gather towards leveling up your crafting disciplines. Keep in mind that I'm going to be assuming you're familiar with the content of my first guide. So if you haven't seen my beginner's guide yet, there will be a link on your screen now that will take you to that video if you want, and then you can come back to this one. Also, I just want to remind everyone that this information is taken from the pre-purchased beta stages of Guild Wars 2. If you're watching this after launch, keep an eye out for annotations in the video indicating any changes. And lastly, the materials efficiency portion of this guide should apply to every crafting discipline except cooking, because cooking doesn't quite follow the same rules regarding materials. Enough with the introduction, let's get down to business. To start off, I want to talk briefly about tool durability. I mentioned in my last video that all tools start off with a durability of 100. That wasn't entirely accurate. Harvesting sickles start out with a durability of 50, but it's not as bad as it might sound. I had an opportunity during a recent stress test to experiment a bit with durability, and what I found was the durability loss is at least somewhat predictable and also much less for harvesting sickles than it is for logging axes and mining picks. Zoomed in here you can see my sickle has 47 durability remaining. When I go to gather from this harvesting node you can see that it's one action and I'm granted experience in one lump sum. When I return to my hero pane and look at my sickle's durability again you see it is decreased by one. Logging axes and mining picks are different. I'll use a mining example to illustrate. Zooming in here we see that my mining pick has 96 durability remaining. When I gather from this copper node, instead of one action and one lump sum of experience, I swing three times and gain experience three times. The same holds true for logging. When you gather from a tree, you swing three times and gain experience three times. And now you can see that the durability on my mining pick has decreased by three. Three swings equals three durability loss. Just to be clear, this is not exact. For example, you may have noticed that the mining pick I used in the example had 96 durability before I mined from that node, and 100 minus 96 is 4, not 3. There appears to be either some kind of decimal rounding, or maybe even a very minor random influence to durability loss. But I did repeat this test numerous times, and the outcomes were consistent enough to at least provide you with a decent estimate of how long your tools will last. There are a couple of reasons why I took the time to point this out to you. First, I did come across some rich ore nodes during the beta testing. I found a rich copper ore node and a rich iron ore node. Both of these were in areas that weren't necessarily easy to get to, and both of these required 10 swings of my mining pick to fully deplete. The last thing you want to do is roll up on one of these nodes and find that you don't have enough durability remaining on your pick to get the job done. The second reason is because whether you're mining from a rich node or a regular node, I'll show you what can happen on the last swing of your mining pick right before it hits zero durability. I've got three durability remaining on this pick, so I backtrack to the silver node I passed on my way to the iron node I just mined from. Ruined ore chunks are vendor trash, and even then they're worth next to nothing. Remember to carry spare tools and keep an eye on their durability. That's it for the gathering segment, so let's move on to storage. To be honest with you, this is something I should have covered in the basic guide, but the video footage was corrupted, so I took some more footage and now we can talk about it. This is the basic bank user interface. Banks are located in every major city, and you can find them on your map by looking for the bronze circle icon with the bag on it. If we look off to the left we can see two tabs. The tab we're on now, indicated by the bag icon, is the general storage tab. Right below that with the list icon is the collections tab which we'll cover momentarily. ArenaNet was thoughtful enough to include a search feature, and you can see that typing even a partial item name starts to filter the items down to match what you've typed. If you've played other MMOs this is pretty common stuff, so let's switch over to the collections tab and take a look at that. I did move some things from the general tab to the collections tab between segments here, so in order to avoid confusion, items in your collections tab do not take up space in your general storage tab, and that's one of the things that makes this feature so awesome. I'll zoom in so this is a little easier to see. The first section of the collections tab is dedicated to common crafting materials. You can mouse over each slot to see what kind of items you can put here. We have spots for all different kinds of ore and ingots, cloth scraps, bolts of cloth and thread, leather sections and squares, as well as logs and planks. 
With the exception of trophies and gems, all of the base materials for 7 out of the 8 crafting disciplines can go in this section of the collections tab in your bank. Trophies and gems have to be stored in the general storage tab. You'll notice I said 7 of the 8 disciplines, and you've probably heard me mention that some of the things in my guides don't apply to cooking because it's different from the other disciplines in terms of raw materials. Let's scroll down to the cooking materials section of the collections tab. Yep, 102 different ingredients just for cooking. And while we're here scrolling down, that third section at the bottom is reserved for mini pets. Now, the collections tab all by itself is a great feature. Keep in mind that all of your bank storage, including the collections tab, is shared by all characters on the same account. It's a great alternative to mailing things back and forth, even if it means that you can't create additional characters just for extra bank space. Note that you can place soulbound items in your general bank tab, but only the character that the item is bound to can take them out. There's one last thing regarding the Collections tab that takes the feature from something handy to something truly convenient. Here I am out in the field, nowhere near a bank, but if I open my inventory and right click on items that can be placed in the Collections tab, I'm given the option to send them there. There's no fee to do so and no delay. That means that you can equip tools on your character, grab a stack of salvage kits and head out into the field. Gather and salvage to your heart's content and then when your bags start to get full, ship the raw materials off to your collections tab to use or sell later. I never thought I'd get excited about such a basic aspect of an MMO, but I really think the good folks at ArenaNet did a great job with this. We've moved on to the next segment of the guide here. Amongst the numerous great questions people asked about my last video, one of them was whether or not you can train more than two crafting disciplines on one character. The short answer is that yes, you can. The long answer is that you can train and level all crafting disciplines on one character, but you can only have two disciplines active at any one time. In order to help illustrate this more clearly, I created a new character just to be safe, and I've just talked to the Huntsman Trainer and learned the discipline. You can see there was no fee, I just had to ask. I trained Huntsman to level 3, and then ran over to the Leather Working Trainer and learned that discipline. You'll notice that once again there was no fee or any mention of any kind of restriction. Using materials gathered by my main character and put into the bank, I level Leatherworking to 7, and now it's time to be greedy and go learn a third discipline. You'll notice there's still no fee to learn the Jeweler Discipline, but I'm told I can only have two active disciplines and asked which one I want to deactivate. I'm told that deactivating a discipline won't cause a loss of progress, but reactivating it will carry a fee. In order to complete my little test, I ran back to the Huntsman Trainer to see about reactivating the Huntsman Discipline. Now we see where the fee is involved. You'll notice that in order to reactivate Huntsman, I have to pay 30 copper. I ran out of time to do any further testing, but based on what we've been told, the fee scales up based on the level of the discipline you're reactivating. When I get a chance to do a little more testing, I'll add an annotation to this section of the video with my findings. Alright, we've survived all the miscellaneous details and now it's time to focus on the main reason I decided to put this second guide together, and that's to discuss how to get the most out of the materials available to you when it comes time to progress your crafting disciplines. In my last video we discussed the benefits of discoveries in helping to progress quickly, and that's still very much a part of what we'll be discussing here, but there are some other things we can consider in order to refine our approach. I'll be using weaponsmithing to illustrate most of these principles, but as with my last guide, this information should apply to all disciplines except cooking. And just to be clear, from what I've seen of the jeweler discipline, the same general principles apply, except you'll be using different kinds of gems instead of trophies as the basis of your discoveries. Before we get too carried away with the gameplay footage, let's pause for a minute and take a closer look at how the different tiers of progression are staggered. When you train a brand new crafting discipline, you start out at level 0. From level 0 to level 74, you'll be using the same raw materials for everything you make. Depending on the discipline you chose, this would include things like copper ore, greenwood logs, jute cloth, etc. From level 0 to 24, you'll be able to refine those raw materials. You'll be able to make components from your refined materials. You'll be able to make some enhancement items using trophies. And you'll be able to combine components with enhancement items to produce finished gear. 
During this time, pretty much anything you make will earn experience towards your discipline's next level. Once you hit level 25 and through to level 49, you will earn little to no experience from refining raw materials and making components. Instead, you'll get new recipes for enhancement items that you will then combine with the same components you've been using in order to create higher level gear. And then from level 50 through to 74, it's the same thing. You're still using the same raw materials and components as you've been able to make since level 0, but you're given yet another tier of enhancement items to make even higher level gear. Once you hit level 75, the whole pattern repeats with the next tier of raw materials. So instead of using copper ore, green wood logs, jute cloth, etc., now you're using iron ore, soft wood logs, and wool cloth. For that reason, I look at level 0 to 74 as tier 1, and level 75 to 149 as tier 2. The maximum level for a crafting discipline at this point is 400, and I'm fairly confident that we can speculate this tier system will continue all the way up to at least level 375. If I'm mistaken, I promise to annotate the guide with the correct information. Now I apologize if that last segment was a little dull and painful to sit through, but I wanted to make sure I took the time to properly explain what I'm talking about when I refer to different tiers, because for this next segment I'll be starting out at tier 2 with weaponsmithing. You'll notice as I just hit 75 here that all the red recipes in the list turned orange, and now I've moved on from bronze ingots and greenwood to iron ingots and softwood. I've got a bunch of softwood logs here that I'd stockpiled, and as I convert them to planks, you see I start out earning 301 experience for each plank, and that amount drops off by about 10 experience each time I go up one level. In my last guide, I talked a lot about discoveries and how quickly they can help you to progress, and that's true. In an ideal situation where you had limitless and immediate access to all the materials you want, we wouldn't have to give much thought to what we make and when we make it. The reality is that raw materials, gems, and trophies, while not exactly rare, can still take a fair amount of time to farm up in any significant quantity. Obviously, if you invest a lot of time into generating wealth for your character by playing the market or farming and selling things, this will be less of an issue for you, but I'm approaching this guide from the point of view of someone who doesn't have a ton of currency to spend on leveling their crafting disciplines. The idea I came up with was that I could probably save a lot of time farming for raw materials if I focused my efforts in the first 25 levels of each tier on making refined materials and components. For example, here I'm focused on making softwood planks, iron ingots, and weapon components. If you want to make some gear for yourself or others in this stage of the process, by all means do so, but this is where I found it's important not to allow yourself to get too impatient unless you can afford to buy a lot of materials from the marketplace. As I continue on here refining raw materials and making components, you can see that the experience from this really starts to drop off, and the temptation is to start using these components with enhancement items just to speed things up with discoveries. If I do that, the time I save moving through these first 25 levels is not going to make up for the extra time I have to spend farming more materials to make the components I'll need to move through the other 50 levels in this tier. I'll pause briefly here as we approach level 100 because some people have asked me what happens when you reach level 100 with a craft discipline. You can see that at least in this beta version of the game, the max level just jumps up to 200 and you get an achievement. Again, if that changes at launch, I'll annotate accordingly. You've probably noticed that I was making soft wood dowels in order to push myself over to level 100, and I just want to point out that even though these show up in the refinement category of items, these are only used to make inscriptions that I'll need to level from 100 to 124. I've made a total of 22 of these, and even that was too many, and I could have actually used the wood planks to make more weapon components instead of dowels I won't need. But now we're done with the components, and you can see already that I've moved on to making finished weapons and getting discoveries to move rather quickly through these levels. All told, it took me under 4 minutes from this point to reach 125. But there's one last thing to cover, and that's how many of each component you might want to make in the first 25 levels of a given tier. The short answer is about 6 of each component, and absolutely no more than 9 of each. The reason is that between level 100 and level 149, I'll be able to make a total of 9 different kinds of inscriptions. The 3 you see here from 100 to 124, and then I get 6 new ones at 125. Even though I'll be able to make a total of 9 different kinds of inscriptions, some trophies are harder to come by than others, so to be safe I would suggest you start with 6 of each component, and if you have any refined materials left over after that, set them aside and if you need more components later you can decide what to make at that time. At level 150 I would expect to move from iron and wool to steel and linen, and I would repeat the same process. 
And that's it. That brings us to the end of the guide. As always, I hope it was helpful to you. If you have any comments, feel free to leave them below. I'll continue making more guides and videos for Guild Wars 2, so if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Take care, guys.